idea. Um, I just came across this in the past 48 hours. So I just registered for account. I'm still like new to this, but apparently um, doing replicating pharma French using the words data set, which is Warren's data analytic research provider is mm -hmm. the best way to do it because it comes with crisp data set, which is used in all the theoretical studies and it provides copy stats. So it's better statistical analysis. Um, I looked online and I saw that Usually, um, academia has partnerships with the words database, and Lehigh actually used to have it. Complementary of PwC used to provide it, um, but then I think they was removed as of March. So I registered uh, for an account through like Lehigh on the words data set. So we'll see if that works. Oh, it's not necessary. Okay, talk to me again. Who? Are you? Yeah. So Warren University of Pennsylvania. Yeah, let Warren. me see if I could. What's the name? What's it all? Oh, W R D S. Okay. Um, it basically is just like a top, it basically comes with okay. crisp data set, which is like the main stock ticker information, like all, everything regarding stocks. Center for Research of Securities something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like Center for Research and So what is it called? WRDS? WRDS. What? what is it? What is it? What's the actual name of it? It's Warren, it's Warren Research Data Services. And I know Lehigh oh. used to have like Wharton. a subscription, but we'll see once I get like once I get call, contacted from the customer rep to see if we still have it or not. Yeah, let me know. Let me see, find out if we um. Mm -hmm. we, uh, do me a favor. You you had, you had mentioned a book the last time with uh, uh, um Andrew Eng. Yeah. Can you can you email it to me? Email yeah, me the book yeah, itself. I, yeah. I want to. Um, yeah, I'll send it to you. Um, it like helped me a lot with like the theoretical understanding of like. But how did you get? So how did you get the book? Um, in the beginning, when I was just like looking up like factor, like to get an understanding of factor investing in the current time period, I wanted to see like who's performing proper factor investing on like active management. Um, came across BlackRock because of course it's BlackRock. Mm -hmm. um, they have a strong factor beta investment team. Um, he was the head of the factor investment team. So I reached out on LinkedIn and I was basically like, like I knew it wouldn't get anywhere, but I tried like sending a message and then digging in deeper. I saw that he re like wrote a book. He wrote a couple books, but he wrote a specific book on like factor investing for the asset management like community. And it's nice because he's less technical and he's more theoretical. So like, it's a lot more like understanding the implications and less like, had it implemented so i, I, and, I like but so you when you when I, so you got the book itself did you get the book itself or yeah it was online it was on google did you buy it um i i, I can say i did i guess i didn't okay. but like it, it's not like i had to like dig for it like i just looked up the title and like online. no because I, the reason i'm saying that is because um i do have access like for example, um, I was talking to um, uh, Juha last week. He's one of the IAC. He was on. He was. Uh, he was at uh, Transamerica. And now he's doing something that he can't really talk about. But um, he did tell me about this book. He says, you know, this is what you students should be looking in more. And he's gonna. You're gonna hear him when he talks. On the six, um, it's called the computational um, modern computational finance, AAD and parallel simulation by Savine and Anderson. So I was able to get a copy of the book. I mean, but not a physical copy. Um, and I, I want you to, uh, you know, give me your information. So I want to get all these books. So um, let's see how we could share this. So um, because of my status, I'm able to, they, they, they'll, they'll give me the book to kind of um, sample it. Let's put it this way. Right? Um, and I think we need, uh, we're going to, we're going to need new books at some point. Uh, more um, performing books. Yes. I wanted to return to the kind of the issue of the present. We have moved, and Jordan and Randy, please check it. We've moved away from the survey, and now this is implementation. This is no longer like what's going on in the industry. Here's a yeah, yeah, yeah. paper. This is like we're writing our own proprietary algorithm to do this. Um, 
Manish seemed a little skeptical on the phone last week. Yes. We just want to be clear that we, we're, we're, we're doing it. This is no longer just... No, 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 no. It isn't. This is your project, right? Uh, yeah, no, definitely. I mean, sure. I mean, I'd rather you do it. Um, because, and the thing is, how are you going to use this? I mean, we got to make sure that you're not barking at the wrong tree, meaning that this is actually being used. Okay, that, that was his point. Because I will tell you, in fact, I think Jordan knows that, right? When he first proposed this idea about Pharma French and, and I, I reached out to Juha, right? And Juha is, uh, Coppola is, uh, he's, uh, he, he can be kind of, kind of controversial, right? One of the things he told me was, uh, you know what? Uh, maybe we shouldn't do that much math, right? Maybe, maybe what you guys should be doing is becoming more of a global, kind of individual. I mean, you should know math, right? But maybe instead of taking that much math, take a little bit more math and take maybe some other courses having to do with, um, um, yeah, for example, uh, this thing with, uh, we'll talk about it when we get to Inca Digital, like they wanted us to work on agent-based modeling. I wanna make sure we are hitting all of as much as possible or what's going on in the market right now. Not to make you a specialist of anything in particular, but at least that you could talk the talk, to at least, you know, um, understand it. Or, because you don't wanna, and so my, to my point with Juha, when I first told, told him about Family French, he says, oh, Patrick, that's great as a, as a uh, student uh, research driven, but people don't use that. Yeah. So I, I can kind of speak to that, which is like yeah. a really cool thing. So yes, like, and like, I agree with like what Manish was saying, like it's great. And what we're doing is replicating Farmer French to start because that provides an, a ba not only a baseline, but like a track to go off of. Cause then we know how to construct the portfolios. We know how to test the deviations. We know how to test the beta and see its significance. That's why it's so vital. But the interesting thing about what we're doing is that we're kind of branching off of that because we're measuring once we can actually replicate this and add the model, like Farmer French and came out and said, we don't have a perfect model. We're only at best explaining 90% of them. Every single thing that isn't explained could be better explained with a model that includes more factors or just better predicts it. So we're focused more on like the anomalies of what has higher returns given a lower level of risk. Why that's so important is because factors now are be providing more of a diversification across asset classes. So in the past, it used to be, um, let's have 60% equities and 40% bonds because um, we want to diversify. But recently they've seen that they're highly correlated and more so than factors. So by in like focusing this research on factor investing and what we're doing, we're finding ways to diversify portfolios. So like you say, how it's applicable to go into job applications. I haven't like, I've like networked and had like coffee chats with people where I've talked about it. I haven't specifically talked about it in interviews yet. Uh, I haven't like higher views, but the idea is that portfolio managers want to diversify their risk and have better explained returns because nobody wants that negative, like you just look at a lot of the top funds and a lot of their funds have like negative 4% returns. Why is that? If you can explain it more with diversifying across factors, it provides more risk diversification. And that's something that all portfolios want. So like you were saying yeah. like how it's applicable, like that's how it's applicable because by well, learning about it. Where yeah, and, and I would agree with you because I think that uh, the fact that you were able, able to get Ben Stein's attention at BNP Paribas, I know he is now, he, uh, he's off, he works in the asset management group off, I never actually worked with him, but they, they did their own thing away from anyone. And But the fact that he stopped everything that he was doing and spent time with you, so you were barking at some tree here. You know, you may not get where he wants you to be, but obviously he's interested in, in so, so that's a, that's, that's a good project. So somebody's interesting in it. So, so at least, uh, you know, if there's something going on there, you're not just doing some um, uh, academic research, which, you know, it's great, but how is that going to, is that, that going to help me? So, so that's something there, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, it's not just like replicating research. Like that is a good baseline and that's what we're gonna have by like yeah. November. But um, that's not the focus of the project. So November 6th, what are you going to present? What are you, how is it gonna be different than the presentation you did for uh, the conference? What are you thinking? 
I'll talk about the technicals. So at this point in time, what we can do is we can, obviously we'll start with the theoretical, you know, challenge cap M kind of stuff. And then we'll go into like, so what I can do is I can show what Fama French gives and then how neural networks uses the same inputs but makes it better, right? So in other words, as Jordan said, solves those anomalies that aren't explained in the model. In other words, decreases the errors. In other words, pulls risk out of the model. That's what I can do. That is easily shown. And also it can demonstrate some coding capabilities. I want you to be more technical this time around. Yeah. I want oh, you exactly. to yeah, yeah, yeah. This yeah. is gonna be like you'll see you'll see graphs, you'll see regression output, you'll see numbers. You're not gonna see how much time you're gonna need. Like what do you guys think? I'm probably like fifteen to go through, not including questions. Tops. Yeah. Not including questions. If they're interested i let them ask a question. Uh, Realistically, it may be less because like, like Brian said, but like because of what Manish wanted, like I feel like 60 to 70% of this presentation is going to be focused on like, like obviously like introducing it, but then like the farmer French and then the last 30% is going to be our focus of the project because we're going to say, this is what we're doing. This is what we're building it off of farmer French. This is what we have from a French. Now that we have this, this is what we want to tell you about. This is a neural network. This is the optimization, and this is the strategy of where we're taking this project. And I think to add to that, we can say this is what we can say. Okay, here's the out of sample prediction that Fama French gives. Back in like the '90s, right? Whatever. This is what it gives. Randy can take that and make a portfolio and be like, all right, here's this. Here's the here's the risk. Here's the return. It's expected that is right. We'll take the same exact inputs and we'll have the neural network give us give us the, those expected return predictions and we'll have Randy make a portfolio out of those, right? And then we can compare, right? And say, hey, this is what the portfolio looks like if you, you, uh, if you, um, if you forecast using machine learning. This is what, it, what the forecast looks like if you're just using your basic um, Fama French model. See, look, see the improvement here. Okay, because um, um... Who's going to be there? Uh, Juha is going to be there. And so is uh, uh, Labib is going to be there. Um, and who else? Um, I, I hope that um, Jordan, what's uh, Daniel? Daniel. He hasn't replied back, but I think that's probably because he oversaw it, but I know he was interested and uh, you know, he, he put this thing together and I sent it to you guys to give you a feel what he's doing now. And he did mention to me about a potential project. So, and he's, uh, so he's a PhD in, um, I think he's a mass PhD and he, and I uh, taught before and, and worked at Blue Mountain. So if I have these three people on there, they are the one that I really want to kind of go over what you're doing and, and making sure we're in the right direction. And, and obviously, de facto, uh, you know, once you're done, uh, they should listen to what else you could offer. So I think that, that that's something that's, that, that's important. Um, Randy, what are, you, what are you doing in this whole process here? Yeah, uh, so um, like my phase is after like uh, Jordan determines which factors most important and after Brian determines the expected returns. So uh, like my part is kind of like separated from theirs. But um, so I found a, a textbook that I've been reading that's pretty helpful on a conceptual um, level. Can it's, you send me the, the email to me? Yes. When you say you found a textbook, I'm going to ask you the same question as Jordan. Where, was it, where you find the book? Uh, where? Yeah, so I, uh, I met with Professor Zuluaga and he recommended it. Um, oh yeah, and I like found it like the same way as like Jordan did. Um, what is this way that no one wants to talk about? So you guys bought it or you guys are kind of... So like, I don't, it? I, I don't know if this is like, like as under, like not understood. If I want to find out, uh, where, where are the other Ben Stein of the world? What should I be looking for? John, are you, are you talking to other people like that? Or, um, 
Yeah, I mean, I try to talk to as many people as possible. I tried getting on the phone. I tried like finessing my way into Andrew Yang um, because I had a conversation with someone from um, BlackRock who works with the portfolio analytics and I tried getting, and I like mentioned like, oh yeah, I casually read Andrew Yang's book and I tried seeing like if he knew him and he told me he works with this team. So I didn't ask then because it would be like a little bit rude for me to just like spend the time to like use his time to talk to someone else. But like, I tried talking to him, but in terms of like finding other people, I found Ben Steiner through Sri and Quant University. So usually like I look up like, like typically people that focus on this topic have tons of publications out there. Like this guy named Matthew Dixon, he's a professor at University of Illinois. Um, he like presents a lot of the time too. So like, he's like, it's not hard to find like the people that specialize in this area because like they continuously put out information on it. So yeah, like, but I want them to be, uh, I don't want to go too much go after the academics. I want to go after yeah. the, no, the I know. Ben Stein at BNP Paribas. What about, what do we know at BlackRock? Um, Professor, the one thing, so obviously, so there's a lot of the firms, and Jordan, I think you would agree, the AQRs of the world, the ground capital managements of the world, the 0.72s of the world, they have these smart beta funds. They have these portfolio managers who are basing their strategies on this exact thing. The problem there is the problem I ran into the other day. You get on the phone with these people and then it's just woke. Um, Jordan, I don't but know. That's okay, but that's okay. But, but, but that's what you said. Yeah. But you're supposed to be totally overwhelmed. You know, that's the idea. You, you, yeah. you it's just the way you react to it, right? Uh, you have to be, uh, and that's something that I need to think about when I look for the next, you know, student profile, right? Is um, um, yeah. to make sure you're on the same way, but but you've got to f to f find your way uh, so that you um, come up with something that is interesting and usable, and in the process you kind of test yourself too, and. Plus, it has to be interesting, right? Otherwise, it's kind of boring if you do somebody else's project. But yet, you don't want to be barking at the wrong tree. He's He was right in the sense where, like, it is good to, like, replicate from our friends to start off because that's showing us that we know how to properly, like, they want a Nobel Prize for what they did. So, like, it's considered, like, very accurate and reputable. Um, so, if we're able to replicate that, we know the necessary steps we need to take to prove something is reputable, like, to prove... And that's what a lot of people say. Like that was the one thing um, Ben Steiner like kept repeating in our call. He was like, "Modern governance is the most important thing. Like making sure your model is like can be like accurate. Making sure you have the right like parameters. Making sure you're following the right steps." So like by can, like replicating Farmer French, we're in a way doing that. Okay, uh, let me take some of your time uh, because at two o'clock we've got um, we've got uh, Ben uh, Ben Lozano at the CMBX courtesy of um, Liz. Um, uh, Jack is here. Is Ramos here? Yes. So, um, and Mike. Yes. So, um, there's another project that's kind of coming through the pipes. And um, it's an index. Uh, maybe I want you to you guys tell me what you think. So basically, uh, Professor Naya, the chair, is saying, hey, uh, why don't we create an index, a Lehigh index of companies based in Pennsylvania? Simple enough in construction is just, uh, you know, which companies you pick, uh, what do you do with it? And, you know, other universities have uh, indices like uh, Yale as the example, they've got the, uh, the Schiller PE index, right? That if you want to know what's going on with the PE, you go to Yale and Schiller just has this, this, this index. And I think it's adjusted for uh, inflation, a bunch of other things. Uh, uh, Ramos, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Uh, what else do we have? Um, Harvard's got their own indices, right? Because you were looking into that. Right. Uh, I think uh, Harvard has it. Uh, 
Harvard has it, Princeton and Yale both have it. Rutgers ha might have it, but I don't have the access to see the whole thing. But what is it, but, but what are they tracking? Um, they're basically just tracking global finances. No one is really tracking a PA. So I think so yeah, but far- But how do they use it? How do they use it? What do they do with it? Um, the way they do it is most like, it's most more like a raw data. Um, I know, I know you, you told me the difference between indices and index, um, but so far, I don't think they have a really holistic, um, like a live fetch of the index. Yeah. A lot of them just what? posted like a data set of like what they've found, but there's no analysis and there's nothing. No, I know, but I want to know how it's being used. How it's being used by people. Is it in a website? Uh, is it uh, being referred to? Jack, did you get to think, or Mike, did you get to think about this a little bit? Well, we, um, just in speaking with, with Professor Nair, uh, the, I guess the intention for this one specifically is uh, to try and bring light to the, Pennsylvania. what the Pennsylvania market cap, if you will, looks like versus, you know, the whole market. So, what he what he has tasked us with, um, and, and you're talking about this, is creating some kind of market weighted index to follow publicly listed uh, Pennsylvania equities. Um, and what we kind of were, were talking about doing is uh, what what we were thinking about is how how this would be used. And what Professor Nair was saying was this would probably be used as a kind of like, hey, this is what. Pennsylvania bring, this is how Pennsylvania drives the market. You should invest money in Pennsylvania from a policy standpoint, more so than an investing standpoint, but I'm sure that there's ways to make money with this kind of index if you were uh, a fund manager. So what we were talking about doing was creating essentially just a, a market weighted index of uh, equities that trade either on the, uh, on the New York Stock Exchange and the NASDAQ kind of thing. Cause we don't want to get too into like pulling it over the counter equities uh rather be in the more like uh regulated and understood world um mm -hmm. of the exchanges but then within that create sub indices that follow like the s p right. 500 companies that are in the s p 500 that are headquartered in pennsylvania or that are in the russell 2000 that are headquartered in pennsylvania or going in a completely different perspective do it regionally so you have Pittsburgh area companies versus Philadelphia area companies and that kind of thing. And the so idea you're thinking, is, yeah. so you're thinking like a way to just, you click on that page and you've got like a bunch of different ways to look at the right. quote unquote PA right. stuff. So well, basically, you, oh, you, you go, go ahead, Ramos. Oh yeah. So basically on Wednesday, uh, Professor, you weren't there, but the three of us kind of stay over and talk about like okay. some different ideas that we can do. And Mike brought up a really good point. Uh, maybe we can like have a interactive data that shows uh, that kind of like put out as an ETF kind of like uh, what is the Pennsylvania pharma industry, uh, their manufacturer industry and also like their tech industry stuff like that and then kind of compare to uh, the, the general overall market in the US and just pr like pr providing the data showing like what kind of sectors Pennsylvania's are good at and also uh, Jack was bringing up the idea that we can uh, kind of like run a 90 days regression and to compare the overall market and see what exactly is driving the the market in general. But where, okay, so that's kind of the, what it's supposed to look like, but where do we house this thing? How does it, where do, where do we put this thing and how I'm, does I'm it get access? I'm thinking more of a website. Yeah, uh, this this is the kind of thing we would probably have to have on, on its own website because I don't think we really yeah. know like who's going to use it. We don't know how much traffic it could get. So it kind of needs, uh, we think it needs to be its own thing. Is this, is uh, this how the other guys are doing it? Is this how, uh, I don't know. What, what... No, they're mostly just posting PDFs. Yeah. About... A lot of the, a lot of the other universities, it's mostly raw data. Like it's just raw data and PDFs. What do you mean Mike? Uh, raw data? It's, it's kind of like a CSV file. It just like dates, time, what happened, calculation, price. So why, what are they getting out of this? What is it? 
what are they getting out of this of doing this what what's the it's not advertised anywhere it's not uh they're not advertising it's more like a like a library resource a lot of university use it as so you mean no one in, go ahead mike i was just saying so if we were to actually create this index and i don't know how it would work um we'd have to talk to naira about it but maybe if we put a link if we made a website on the MFC site, uh, yeah. we'd be kind of the first to actually have a specific index relating to PA companies or the different sectors like we were talking about. Um, like Rama said, with the other universities, it's more just raw data and kind of like a library of information that people can access. So I think I think a website would personally be the way to go, but I would love to hear your input. Right, especially but, especially something like a more interactive website that you can, or or you have you have built-in function functions to 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 either sort or group them by industry, or group them by the performance base to compare to the overall market. I think I think that would be really interesting. And then so far, even though I cannot confirm, no one has done the PA thing, but like I've done. Uh, a lot of, uh, you know, just like web searching, I don't see anyone that's doing the PA index. Okay. Hey, uh, guys, uh, I think it's two o'clock and we have our guest, um, Ben Lozano has joined us from um, SMBX. Ben, can you, can you hear us? Liz is here too. Hey, Ben. You're on mute. Yeah, as usual. Cool. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Perfect. Great. Hey, Liz. Hey, everybody. Hi. Hey. Um, well, before we get started, I'd love to give Ben an introduction. Please. Um, Thank and you. Ben to introduce you to the class. So, Juan, you're talking to Lehigh University to financial engineering graduate students. And over the Great. past couple of weeks, um, we've had some speakers come on who are helping with trading data. Like these are potential future quant traders, they may get into crypto. And so I think that they've gotten a lot of details on, on trading data, on finding mar uh, opportunities in the market, on pricing data, things like that. And the reason I really wanted you to join, one, because you have a background in finance, obviously, but two, as students, I would really like for them to think about new product offerings. And that's what I think you did really well, or what you're doing really well, is you're finding opportunities in the market in a different way. Like who's not being serviced in the financial industry right now? And where can you find opportunities to develop a business around it? So with that, everybody, I'm, I'm really excited to have Ben here and for him to share about SMBX, a company which I support and uh, yes. <laughs> buy bonds through all the time. So, all right, Ben, take it away. Cool, thanks, Liz. So I don't have any slides prepared. I can show you what we've built and I can talk about our roadmap, but I thought it might be helpful here if I gave you a little bit of uh, background on uh, who I am and then how I discovered the SMBX. Does that work for y'all? Sure. Okay, cool. So uh, my name is Ben Lozano. Uh, my dad's name is Ben Lozano CPA. Uh, he runs a boutique financial accounting firm in Santa Ana, Orange County, California. Uh, growing up, um, you know, as a SoCal kid, I uh, surfed and I um, worked at my dad's uh, financial accounting firm. My brother worked there too for a while. Um, and so early on, you know, we were walking, we were helping small businesses engage in, um, you know, growth planning, uh, financial planning for their growth. You know, somebody owns a prof, you know, three or four profitable dry cleaners. They want to raise a million dollars to open up a, a, a fifth and sixth one. Um, you know, they go take out a um, small business loan. So we walked a lot of small businesses through the frictionville process of getting, um, you know, a, a small business loan. So, um, you know, that was kind of my first experience in finance. Uh, later, I went and did a PhD at UC Santa Cruz, where they allow you to study uh, weird stuff that uh, maybe uh, traditional programs wouldn't, wouldn't allow you to do. Um, so I, my research um, in finance uh, and a book that I ultimately wrote on finance was really looking at um, synthetic, synthetic financial instruments. Uh, you think of synthetic CDOs, credit derivatives, synthetically structured 
securitized products, those kind of things. And I was trying to apply, um, uh, I'm, I'm on, I don't want to, I'm on a call for the next 30 minutes. Sorry. Uh, you know, we all work from home. So, um, so the, uh, you know, um, so I was applying high order nonlinear dynamical systems theory models uh, to the behavior of these financial assets. And that's kind of the punchline of my work or whatever. Um, so uh, I was defending my dissertation in 2008 as the financial crisis was unfolding. And uh, it was not a good time to be having done work on synthetic CDOs and credit derivatives and these kind of things. Um, so I hunkered down. At, I didn't go out into finance. Uh, I didn't go into the financial industry. And I hunkered down at UC Santa Cruz and built out a um, what they called a critical finance program, but it was really a fintech research program. So back in like 2010 was the first time that the term finance and tech were getting like fused together. And in Silicon Valley, when people say fintech, they really mean fintech. And when they uh, say it back in your, you know, Manhattan, they really mean fintech. Uh, but we were studying fintech. <laughs> at UC Santa Cruz. Um, and so at this point, you know, I was teaching finance courses to millennials and was watching their changing relationship to money and investing. You know, they had an aversion or subtle aversion to legacy finance, but they still were interested in finance. They were cash poor college kids, you know, hanging out at UC Santa Cruz, smoking weed, surfing, and, uh, you know, eating Cheetos and playing video games. Uh, but they were interested in finance. Uh, they just didn't know. It, it just was like culturally uh, out of sync with who they were, right? You think of Lloyd Blankfein, the former CEO of Gold's, Goldman Sachs, like kind of sitting there getting grilled by Congress and these congressional hearings that were taking place back then when it sounds like most of you were probably around, uh, you know, college age or, or maybe even in high school or, or elementary school at that time. But, um, you know, that was what they were experiencing back in 2008, 2009, 2010, you know, 2012 and so on. Um, and, uh, you know, so what you were looking at was these kind of changing relationships to money investing. Um, a student came into my uh, uh, office in 2010 and explained to me, 2010, and explained to me this thing that was super innovative that he was stoked about and wanted to do an independent study on. It was called the Bitcoin. Uh, and he wanted to do an independent study on it uh, with me and uh, the chair of the econ department at UC Santa Cruz. Uh, he explained it to me as smart college kids do in about five minutes. I was like, that sounds interesting. I've never heard of that before. Um, I looked into it, you know, bought a few Bitcoin, of course. Um, and uh, the, since then, you know, was was getting into the crypto space and, and blockchain as a revolutionary financial technology if used properly. He couldn't get um, approval, though, from the econ chair to do it, who said it sounded like bullshit. Uh, it sounded like a Ponzi scheme and it would never work. Uh, but anyways, it put, you know, Bitcoin on my radar. I was going to the original like um, Ethereum meetups down at Galvanize and Hacker Dojo down in Silicon Valley. You know, obviously got super interested as a heterodox financial engineer, which is what I consider myself. Um, you know, was super interested in, in crypto and, you know, participating in the Ethereum crowd sale and was really just, you know, kind of stoked on all that stuff early on. Uh, so I started working um, like consulting for a hedge fund who wanted to take their um, you know, hedge fund note and uh, create a structured financial product of it and put it on the Ethereum testnet. And that was kind of like my hello world moment when I built the first thing and saw it kind of like out in the world having, I mean, it was just, you know, a proof of concept, but it was, it was out in the world uh, and, and, you know, could have an effect on people's life. And that was different from what I had been experiencing by reading and writing and lecturing and not really having an effect directly other than on the students. Uh, you know, having an effect on their life. And at that point, I kind of got this bug for wanting to build stuff. I worked with another group, um, which was a hedge fund, which I don't even know if it was legal, what we did, but we, we created this um, data mining algorithm, as they called it back then, now they call it AI, but a data mining algorithm that um, was able to track and replicate the stock trades of Wall Street's most successful stock traders. Um, we put it out in the market, got a 41% cumulative rate of return. We didn't even back test anything. It was super naive. Like I said, I'm not even sure it was legal. We used that to power uh, or fund a co-op that invested in like art projects that otherwise would have no way of getting funded. So I, we were kind of experimenting back then with these kind of like new social, 
new ways of being social, financial, but in these really kind of perverse ways. And, and I like that. I like perversions. Um, and so, uh, you know, when the Jobs Act got passed, and now I'm going to start talking about my company. Um, when the Jobs Act got passed, what the Jobs Act did, um, and this was during the Obama administration, um, 2012, the Jobs Act got passed, and the Jobs Act now allowed a, pub, a private company to raise public finance without having to comply with public securities law for the first time in history in the United States. So most people thought, okay, the Jobs Act, let's build equity crowdfunding portals. Uh, let's go build out some platform where some risky startup can issue equity capital to the crowd, right? That's how people think about the Jobs Act. I remember reading about the Jobs Act in the newspaper when it came out, like Financial Times or something. Didn't even read the Jobs Act, just read about it in the Financial Times. And like these threads of like, you know, my background in small business accounting and watching the pains of, you know, Hispanic, because that's my, my heritage, Hispanic business owners having trouble gaining access to capital, uh, millennials who were looking for something new, who had an aversion to legacy finance, and today increasingly have investable wealth, right? Today, millennials hold seven or $8 trillion of investable wealth. In 2025, they're going to generate half of US GDP. Uh, but they have a financial system that's essentially out of sync, in my opinion, uh, with their you know, changing relationship to money and investing. So these things were coming together, like wanting to build stuff, wanting to build perversions, having the background in heterodox financial engineering, small business accounting, and then the Jobs Act. And they all kind of inadvertently kind of came together in this idea uh, that I had that, well, frankly, you could use the Jobs Act to build an equity crowdfunding portal, or you could also use it to build the world's first small business capital marketplace. And so because I'm an engineer, you know, financial engineer, as I mentioned, um, what I uh, did was engineer an asset class called the small business bond. Uh, we trademarked it. Um, and then we went and took two years to get regulatory approval Two dark, difficult years of not getting paid, cashing out my precious Bitcoin and ether just so that my family would be able to pay its mortgage. <laughs> Um, so, you know, for two years, we persuaded the regulators that our reading the Jobs Act was, you know, accurate. And so we opened up last year uh, the first half of what I consider our MVP. Um, and that is, uh, uh, you know, a marketplace, the SMBX, where a small business owner can come and connect with people who want to invest in it uh, and uh, earn principal and interest monthly, which is what the small business bond does. Um, the idea of it is this. And then I'm, I'll talk for like another few minutes and we can, you know, just kind of uh, ask questions if, if that works for y'all. Um, what the um, SMBX's wager is, is this. Right now, the money you're not using, the money I'm not using, the money that most of us aren't using. I don't mean our, the money we're using to invest. I mean the money we're not using right now that's just sitting there in a zero interest bank account. The bank takes that money. They lend it out to small businesses in the form of small business loans, right? We fund our banks, right? We, we're the ones who fund our banks with our zero interest bank accounts. The bank takes that money, they lend it out to a small business. We have no say who they lend it to, what kind of world our unused money is being used to support and create. And then on top of it, when the business owner pays back the loan, the bank keeps the profits by lending out our money. That's great. Some people might be stoked on the business model, if I'm a banker, I'm stoked on it. It's like free carry. Um, but what if you could decide for yourself what kind of world you wanted your unused money to support and create? What if, if you could invest in a portfolio of women-owned businesses, the city of Austin, things yielding 7%, California cannabis companies, right? That's what the SMBX was built for for small business owners to come and, and, and say, well, I don't want to take out a loan and, and pay back the bank where the profits that I'm generating are being shared with a bank that's then going to Manhattan. Well, I want to pay back my community, you know, my Instagram followers, people on my mailing list, people who buy my products. And so the small business bond is really finding a series of businesses. And here I'll, I'll share my screen and walk you through um, a, a couple of businesses here. Show 
Can you see my screen? You can just nod. Yes, you can see my screen? Yep. Cool. Yep. Okay, great. So, um, you know, what we have here is businesses uh, who could go take out bank loans. Bruno Cutlery, very profitable, um, high-end cutlery shop in San Francisco um, has like 50, Josh and Kelly have like 50,000, no, I guess 60,000 now Instagram followers who buy their products, right? They're nice. Josh and Kelly could have gone and taken out a bank loan as they were expanding into the mission and, and buying new product and were in growth mode. Uh, but instead they came on our platform and, and we worked with them to create a couple Instagram posts where they just told their customers, like, we're doing a bond offering on SMBX. Uh, come to SMBX and, and, and buy bonds if you want to. And as a simple, simple proposition, you can earn principal and interest by investing in us instead of buying our knives. We worked with uh, Black Hammer Brewery. It's a gay owned, uh, really cool brewery in um, both the Castro and here in Soma. Um, and you could see they did, they've got a bunch of Instagram followers too, like 11,000 Instagram followers. So I'll show you a little bit if I can scroll down fast enough. Um, so when they did an offering, right, we just put together a little bit of stuff here, you know, invest, uh, you know, invest in Black Hammer Brewing, earn principal and interest monthly, you know, and from there, people were directed to the offering. Um, we filled the offering uh, basically by just telling Black Hammer Brewery's customers that they could earn principal and interest. So that's the first half of the MVP. We've got that. We're starting to get the flywheel turning. We listed a new business. Uh, which is a Mexican-owned, Miami-based uh, retail business, like a top 10,000 seller on Amazon. Um, next week, we're off listing Culmination Brewery, which is like the biggest, most popular brewery in Portland. Um, they're going to raise $400,000. And we're just starting to ramp up here um, with retail-based businesses who offer products that people love. And now we're offering them the ability to decide what kind of world they want to invest in and support with their unused money. And so ultimately the goal is for us as we're working with the regulars right now um, to open up our secondary market. And so again, I'm working with my CTO engineering our matching engine, um, which is a first in first out for those of you who are traders interested in that kind of stuff, uh, a price time priority algorithm that will match uh, partially and, and, and fully uh, people who want to trade these bonds. And the idea is once you can provide that kind of liquidity as a service for people, you know, if you think about it, you're earning principal and interest monthly on your unused money. But when you want to take your money to go buy a cup of coffee, uh, you know, you're standing there at Uji time or whatever. You bought some bonds, but then you want to pay for your Uji time. <laughs> Maybe you sell that bond and, and, and then get your money back. And if we can kind of provide with a secondary market that kind of liquidity as a service, uh, we've really created a small business bond exchange um, and really a, a new era high yield bank account. And so the vision of the SMBX is to use the small business capital marketplace for people to invest in diversified portfolios of small business bonds. Uh, and when they get, want their money back, they can get it back. And so in essence, why would you ever store your money? If I can provide you security on that and I can provide you liquidity on that, why would you ever store your money in a zero interest bank account? You should store it in a diversified portfolio of small business bonds earning six to 8%. And so I'd like to really create a habit in our, our users where they are expecting, you no know, demanding, that their unused money is always making money for them instead of making money for the bank. So that's the SMBX in a nutshell. Happy to take questions. I do have a hard stop at 11, 1130, unfortunately, um, but, but happy to, happy to chat with you all. And thanks for your, thanks for your time. And thank you for joining us. This is very, very interesting and some cutting edge stuff. Um, I kind of wanted to ask what, the kind of the market for you and the SMBX has been since obviously COVID came down, retailer storefronts shutting down, continuing to be shut down, investor sentiment kind of fluctuating. Kind of what's been the response? What have you seen on the streets? Yeah, good question. So we were listing our third offering, uh, California Draft Tech, right when COVID hit. Um, and the velocity of bids Let's go in and you can see uh, here, the velocity of bids just like stopped. You can see all the bids, I'm covering it up right now, at least on my screen. You can see, you know, you can see when people bid, 
Um, OK Pool puts like 20, 20 bucks away every day. You can opt in. Uh, most people stay anonymous. I don't know. We can work on you know, encouraging them to, to disclose their identity. It doesn't really matter to us whether they do or not. Um, but the velocity of bids on Oscar's California Draft Tech offering just completely stopped. You know, society obviously got collectively punched in the gut during coronavirus. And then you had shelter in place. You know, you're worried about losing your job. Uh, you're not going to invest in a, in a small business that you're afraid is not going to be around next month. Uh, but so, so we kind of put things on pause. We had 10 million worth of bonds that were in our pipeline. We had a business like a Homewood Cafe in Berkeley. Been around for 20 years. College kids go and eat there. It's like perfect hangover breakfast. Um, you know, as long as UCB students are going to Homewood Cafe, uh, will all of a sudden, you know, will will always be in business. But uh oh, this semester, no UCB students are there. So Homewood now is a is a risk of default. We cannot allow them to be in our pipeline. Unfortunately, we had to get them out. The fact of the matter, small businesses are hurting, and the ones that have been adversely affected and unable to pivot in a post COVID world will not make it. And the SMBX has deliberately kind of try to narrow our funnel very, very tight, very, very quickly, um, you know, because we have a wide opening here. Everybody needs capital today, right? The question is, who's going to be around five years from now to fully pay off the maturing bond? And so we've been a little more judicious. Jackie and I, who built our risk model, had to go back and, and tweak it um, for a post-COVID world. And, we, you know, the problem is, the historical data you had on um, financial crises and recessions cannot be applied to a public health crisis because historically bars do fucking terrific in a financial crisis and recession because everyone's depressed. So they drink. But if all the bars are closed, no one's going to a bar. Right. So you have to, you know, you have to tweak your risk model appropriately. And we've been doing that right now. Society has collectively gotten up on one knee. We may get punched again, you know, come winter. But, um, and so the velocity of bids have returned and it's actually been relatively easy to fill the last two offerings. Um, let me go to uh, Uji time. So we just closed Uji time. Um, we settled Uji time actually, I think on uh, Tuesday or Wednesday of this week. Um, and Uji time, you know, has five locations. One of them might shut down, one of them might not, we don't know, but Uji Time has pivoted from soft serve ice cream to shipping out hard ice creams, right? Well, that's viable, that travels. So now they pivoted in post COVID world. Uh, the cookie department, you know, uh, is no longer relying as much on um, brick and mortar stores and, you know, getting into to local grocery stores. They're shipping their cookies a lot more. So it's a matter of pivoting in a post COVID world. I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, thank you very much. Very, very interesting stuff. Thanks. So, so Ben, uh, yeah, I mean, this is this is very unique. I have to say, this is a little bit like this uh, this panel I'm putting together about uh, you know who owns your data. You know, why are you giving your data away free to uh, Facebook and and these guys? And basically, yeah, hey, sure. You know, you should decide where your money goes. It's your money. It's not your bank's money. That is truly brilliant. I mean, yeah, this is a, thanks. Thanks a lot, Benjamin, for the presentation. This is a really great, innovative um, solution, I must say. Uh, I've got one question. I've got two questions, actually. The first one is on your, um, I'd say, your credit models, your collateral basis. How do you actually do your due diligence? Because I assume that some of the company, that, uh, some of the businesses that you would be bringing to market aren't as well known. And then the second one is also, um, expanding out because from from the way i see it it's also an opportunity to provide access to funding to uh companies that might not necessarily traditionally have access to funding as well so do you have like a growth plan as well in terms of probably moving out of the american uh, region as well to yeah. the african regions as well which uh, which is a great place as well just a quick question totally so on that last question the smbx can take her business model anywhere where the legal climate is right Keep in mind that uh, our, our ability to do this kind of thing is made possible by a, a, um, a kind of unconventional reading of a new law. Uh, and so, you know, without the Jobs Act, it's not legal for me to conduct business and, and we don't intend to break the law as much as we'd like to. Um, so, you know, um, so, so we could right now do business only in the $2.6 trillion SMB funding market uh, of the United States and Canada, because only a legally incorporated U.S. entity 
or Canadian entity can offer uh, a public security on a platform like ours um, to the general public. But if the legal climate is right in, uh, you know, Kenya and, uh, and, and the businesses there have the standardized data of financials that we can't uh, look at in order to evaluate and arrive at a risk profile of that business, then we would absolutely be interested to expand out there uh, for sure, 100%. So um, let's see, uh, as far as due diligence goes, since I think that, that's what I heard in the first question, um, we take the business's last two years of financials and their tax returns, and uh, we plug it through our risk scorecard that we built uh, that was intended to model the risk scorecard of the 7A SBA loan process. Um, and we like the 7A SBA qualified businesses and would like to expand on that because loss given default rates for 7A businesses are extremely low. They're just under 2%. Now that's not default now because you could have 100% defaults, right? But if everybody defaults in the last month, everybody's making money, right? So you really want to focus on loss given defaults. And that's why we ask the businesses when they can to fully secure uh, their offering um, to get a lower interest, slightly lower interest rate, um, for their offerings. Now, Culmination Brewing only had $300,000 worth of beer making equipment, but they want to raise 400,000. So that's going to be partially secured. Uh, but I believe all of our offerings are more or less secured. The first one was not. Bruno Cutlery did not want to secure. And like, we had to talk our way into even getting that one right. I mean, who's going to, you know, like people might like eating pizza, but nobody wants to eat the first slice of a new, <laughs> like we just started baking pizzas. So uh, we talked our way into Bruno Cutlery. The sec second one, uh, Rich at Degrees Plato, which is an Oakland-based tap room, uh, was fully secured with, with his, um, his inventory. Living Luca, which is children's shoes, fully secured with their inventory. Black Hammer Brewery, um, uh, Kevin and uh, Jim fully secured their um, offering with their beer making equipment. Uh, Uji Time as well. Uh, obviously, they have retail. Um, so so we, we generally fully secure things. And that's how we deal with um, loss given default rate risk. Now, long term, uh, what I'd like to do is I'd like to come, I'd have to get regulatory approval to do it, but I'd like to come to you and say, look, you got this diversified portfolio of bonds that's earning you 8%. I will insure the entire thing for you. Just give me two or 300 basis points. Would you do it? Would you, would you transfer that counterparty risk from the business to some sort of insurance product, whether it's AIG or, or better yet me, uh, if I'm going to charge you 3%, so you're not making 8% now, but you're making 5%. Some people will, some people won't, right? Depends on their risk preference. Uh, so what I'd like to do is offer that kind of full security. So we kind of are replicating the use case of the FDIC, which ensures our deposits. That's how I would want to deal with loss given default rate, long term, short term, we secure. All right, thank you very much. Um, I'm sure it's going to be really interesting as well once you get your secondary market operating as well. It should be a very interesting and lucrative market. Thank you. Yeah, I thought the investors would be stoked on it. Actually, the business owners are stoked on it. Like the, the business owners love the idea of, um, like Black Hammer Brewery was like, seriously, so there's going to be bonds trading with our ticker symbol. The reason they like it is because it, it's creating new customers for them. Like if you buy a Black Hammer Brewery bond, you're going to go buy beer from Black Hammer Brewery. So one of the inadvertent things we saw was the businesses that list on our platform get this little sales pop and they actually become a more viable business. And that's for me, one of the really uh, beauties, uh, the, you know, the superior, beautiful side effects of a public financial offering is you get free marketing rather than when private, private finance, you might get low cost of capital, but that's all you get. Karen, right. you have a question? Because he's got a few, uh, two minutes left. Oh, hi, Ben. I have a quick question. So for I'm noticing a pattern of all those shops here They're uh, So their photos are just streamlined and they all look like uh, very uh, elite boutique stores that, uh, you know, from time to time. And I was just wondering, uh, I understand like uh, how bars and cafe group can make money. But how does uh, a cutlery shop like uh, makes money and what's in it for them and what makes them um, what makes them to go to you to like, um, what's in, what's a, uh, what incentivizes them to do it? There's a new class of entrepreneurs who, when you say to them, you can offer your investors a financial product like that idea. 
they like the idea of paying back their customers instead of the bank. Uh, that's our early adopter issuers, the, the small business owners. Bernal Cutlery okay. could have taken out a bank loan. Uh, they, we gave them uh, the same rate, maybe slightly even higher, although usually we get slightly better rates. Um, and they just like that idea. I mean, that's not something we anticipated. Um, we, they just, they like the idea of offering their customers uh, the ability to become their investors. It's not a handout like GoFundMe, right? You're, you're, a, right. you're a viable small business owner, you're a new era entrepreneur that's offering your investors the opportunity to invest in a lucrative financial opportunity, you know, financial uh, opportunity. So um, that's how they view it. I see. Do you also give them like promotion suggestion, like the full package or how, like how heavily is it? Uh, does it rely on like the online Instagram kind of promotion? Uh, yeah, Instagram is a good medium. If you have it, hot, have, you know, a high Instagram follower, Oscar, for instance, did not. Uh, when we went to Degrees Plato, Rich has like a bunch of beers that are listed. You know, like you'll go to like a beer garden or whatever, and you see like the 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 wall of beers where it's like stouts, IPAs, whatever. And then we listed something that said bonds. Like, so the person sitting up there, like, what the fuck is a bond, <laughs> right? And the bartender's like, I don't know. Look at this sign, and he points to this like little cutout that said, "Invest in Degrees Plato and earn." Um, 9%. It's got a little QR code. So the person's sitting there drinking a beer. It's like an Oakland A's baseball player. He's like sitting there drinking a beer and he goes, okay, fine. He takes his, you know, uh, phone out, takes a picture. He's brought to the Degrees Plato website. He clicks on it. He goes, so I'm sitting in a restaurant or I'm sitting in, you know, the, the kitchen or the bar room of Degrees Plato drinking beer. And now I see a bunch of people who are bidding on bonds. It makes it easy for people to go, I'll put in 500 bucks. Um, you know, or in the case of the degree, you know, the, the Oakland baseball player, 10,000. All right. Thank so you we usually much, use, we usually use point of sale, uh, you know, and that's why we like heavy retail base. I see. Okay. Thank you very much for your time. I, I'm sorry I have to go. Right. It's kind of a crazy day. I appreciate your time and uh, don't hesitate to reach out. Um, my email address is Benjamin at the smbx.com. If y'all want to chat more. Uh, if not, go buy well, some bonds and help you. us build this new financial system. We will. All right. Bye, we definitely ben. will. Bye. Thanks, Thanks. Bye, Ben. Later. Thank you. Take care. You too. Wow. This, uh, this was interesting, I have to say. It's really like Kickstarter, but better. <laughs> Well, you know what? This is uh, what uh, this thing is about now. Um, uh, I'm going to do a, um, uh, I don't know if I call it a conference, but I want to get a couple of bunch of people together to talk about the fact that um, uh, who owns the data, right? Uh, this is kind of the idea, right? For example, in, uh, with Facebook and these guys, you are literally giving away information which they resell to you. I mean, this is not a new new concept uh anyway so i have zane here uh steven brian where you guys stand and um um Pacella. right so i can i could just keep Pacella, go ahead yep yeah. yeah so Zane, can you hear us? Um, yeah, yeah. Okay, great. Sorry. Totally clear. Yeah. <laughs> I have this great picture of you. I don't know if you're actually no, right? standing there and no, looking at us. Let me join the matrix. Right? <laughs> no, it's, oh, this is great. You got to <laughs> tell us how to do that background. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's like a video that I clipped to be like um, shorter. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, That's because it. I tried that. The thing is sometimes the video is too it's too large and it won't it has to be a right size right there's a certain amount of yeah you gotta just make sure it's the right size and then okay i have a, a couple of like fun ones here uh for when the, the pressure's showing up let's go ahead and kick it off uh yeah <laughs> this is good uh, here you go <laughs> when the pressure is kicking off <laughs> <laughs> it's just a little. <laughs> Sella, I think you need to do that, here. and uh, Karen as well, because the fan in the background and 
your ceiling is like boring. You know, you got you got to spice it up a little bit. All right. Zane, I, can't Go ahead. Been, I can't believe you've been holding out on these cool backgrounds this whole time. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> we'll sneak that. All right. All right. Um, just in terms of where we've been currently, I think I'll just uh, uh, speak to the bit of progress I've been able to do, yep. and then I'll, I'll give it over to the guys as well to speak to what they've been able to do. So looking at, the, like, as initially I mentioned to Liz and Zane, my main interest, at least after reading and working with a lot, was just the pre preliminarily understanding or looking at cryptocurrencies as an asset. And so I was able to pull out a lot of data, some data, some of these currencies. And I think the greatest progress I've done thus far is I've been able to implement a couple of algorithms, trading algorithms on this cryptocurrency data sets. Um, I've back tested from 2015 to 2020, September. And um, can you still hear me? Yeah, I can still hear you. Yeah. Right. I'm, I'm curious for the results because- Yeah, and then my, 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 my hands just said power off. Anyway, yeah, so what I did was I back, te back tested that, um, use simple uh, machine learning uh, portfolio allocation algorithms and those. These are like uh, your buy hold algorithms, your, um, your constant rebalance portfolio algorithm. So I just took a whole lot of stocks uh, of the cryptocurrencies lumped them together and said, look, if I had these as options, um, how much money could I make? Where could I make money? So I think the most interesting one is when I ran one uh, non-parametric uh, algorithm, it had, it, I, I don't know if, you, I'm sure you know Monero. It's called Monero, right? Yeah, I, I know Monero. XMR. Um, it, had a, it had a huge uh, weighting towards Monero, which was quite interesting. But this is all just preliminary sort of um, work. Not preliminary per se, but just, initial phases of the of the research uh, just to get an understanding and i think the way i saw it lumping into everything is that with uh, the neural networks and the other machine learning components that uh, steven and brian are working on it could actually then help uh, give a more informed forecasting going forward for the library that we might be looking to, to actually get done so in a nutshell that's where i've i've been um yeah so the modeling of returns that I've done, I think the biggest problem that I've run into is in back testing and out of sample testing, lack of data. I don't know how Mitzella feels about this. And again, I'm, I've, uh, Dorenzo and some of the other folks we've talked to, right? We just look at this as a, just another asset in the portfolio. Um, and one of the biggest concerns I have, and this was brought up during the, um, during the Quant conference, um, we got to back test at least 10, 15 years. We just don't have that data. The, the, the chain, the, uh, the ledger's not been out that long. Um, so I guess my concern a little bit is this lack of data and the lack of information about how these assets will fluctuate and respond under stress. Um, we know inequity, how inequity behaved during COVID in March. We saw some 08 data, right? Um, we just don't have that. So I'm kind of, I, I'm, I'm hesitant on my model at the moment, but I think with time, it's just going to continue to refine and approach that 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 that, um, that spot that we want to, for lack of a better term. Yeah, it's really interesting, especially because, like everyone says, it's deregulated market. So some of the assumptions that you make about like pricing efficiency, et cetera, are not a hundred percent valid. So that might like shift and skew your perspective. So in the long term, you imagine it like being like the law of, <laughs> of means or averages, that you're eventually going to like approach um, like market efficiency. But right now you're like probably at 80% market efficiency. And I think or Enzo, some, some sort of number like that. Enzo brought that up. Literally, just, I think literally he said was like, yeah, we're just making money on the fact that things are mispriced. Um, which I think Zoro just slipped off. But I think in essence that like, for my model specifically, I, it's not a trading algorithm. I'm just I'm just trying to understand what factors are going into these returns um, using data that we can pull from them from the blockchain, right? Where, at what point do we have enough data? It's a very difficult question to answer, but I feel like Mitzilla is the same thing, right? Yeah, when think, do we I have think, enough back? I think you, I think you're right there because like the data that you have that I have starts like 2015, 2016. 
and that's that you're saying it might not be enough for a, quite a valid or robust sort of access same, but i figured try to work with what we have and see what what we get out of that but, the same thing for me right and, and in contrast to factors with jordan and randy right take google for example i can i can run 15 years of google data on a neural network and we get pretty good behavior even in a regular ols we have some pretty good explanatory power um and then i can back test on another 10 to 10 years in that um don't have that luxury with some of these newly issued tokens even some of the 2015 uh tokens yeah uh, I think also what I've been doing, I'm also on another project. Um, so I'm, I'm actually going to try to leverage off of, they have like, they're like, they have an aggregator and an API. So I'm going to try to leverage off of that as well, just to make sure that uh, there's some properly aggregated data across the exchanges and see whether anything of value is able to be unearthed from that as well. And I'll obviously share, share like the data that if I'm able to get any with the, with the guys as well to see how far we're able to go with that. Steven? Yeah. Yeah, um, I also work on the same thing this week. I collect the data from the API called get, uh, what does, what does that call? Um, I collect the historical data for the tokens and try to plug it into my, uh, the model I'm using right now, the reinforcement learning model and, and try to put some um, technical indicators as Angel mentioned last week, right? Because the um, because market is um, less regulated right now. So the uh, technical indicators are more useful than before, than in the market, in the equity market. So I'm trying to put those indicators into the model and see how it works. So I'm currently trying to plug the data into the model and hopefully I can get the result and see how the model works. Yeah, I could see that being uh, like more useful because it's, like the technical indicators are more on like uh, recency <laughs> versus like building historical uh, models of like value. Uh, and then the everything is just um, like the actual technology. It's not as though like the stocks themselves change over that 10 to 15 years. Whereas like here with like cryptocurrency, you get these like uh, wide sort of like uh, variances as to like what's going on in the market. So like if you look at Bitcoin in the earlier days, you have a different mining behaviors, different like sort of investments. And then if you look like two years after launch, three years after launch, then you have the rise of like ASIC miners and different companies like investing in it. And then you've got ransomware coming in. And so like just the market conditions are constantly evolving. So I think looking over a longer term may be harder to like sort of pick out those trends until you've seen a lot of rises and falls and rises and falls you can kind of like extrapolate like oh like under these kind of market conditions this is what happens so yeah the other thing might be an interesting approach is thinking about how you can create synthetic data <laughs> Like uh, looking at like a lot of those like uh, generative uh, adversarial networks and seeing if there's any way that you can say like, okay, we have these like four years of data and the like maybe the, the crypto crash of 2017 is your like kind of like recession event or like resetting event. Um, so maybe there's some sort of way to like sample there um, without necessarily overfitting the data. It's a it's kind of a tricky issue, but I would say like a large portion of like what people are doing are looking for pricing arbitrage opportunities. So like being able to see like what pricing data people are actually trading off of um, may be useful. Yeah, that's what I would say. So it's like, if you're looking at five or six different feeds uh, and you're seeing these sort of like pricing, like market movements, that would be kind of interesting. I don't know of the direct way in which you could 
gather that information because there's no real way to say like this person that like made a trade on Binance uh, and then made the opposite trade on Kraken, um, you'd have to like sort of pair those addresses to, <laughs> to figure that out. And then you'd also need to know um, what the recipient address is that this is going to an exchange. And you can get a little bit of that data from using something like Etherscan because some of the deposit addresses are like well known. Uh, so yeah, I would say like if you have point in time databases or time series databases of price, then you may be able to sort of extrapolate like um, what some of the trading intent was or to be able to like see things uh, converge to like what the like price is quote unquote. <laughs> Thanks a lot for that, Zane. Just a just a quick question on that. Um, I think uh, I, one thing I realized when exploring this is that you have two aspects. You have the, let's say, what we're looking at currently, which is pretty pretty much be the currencies or tokens from a price price action level, and then you have the underlying technology that what what the currencies and what uh, blockchain is actually enabled. In your opinion, are they are they um, at least the people that are taking profits in the traditional sense, is as is, is, is much energy being put in on the trading component or just the technology, which is what I've I've actually been seeing a lot. I just want to get a feel of you if you could just compare the two. Yeah. Where, yeah. Where the scale shift comes. Yeah. So I would say the kind of terrible thing is. Um, Within the Ethereum ecosystem, the technology has kind of stalled a little bit. Um, and so on the technology side, people are still working on it, but definitely most of the energy is going towards DeFi because that's where a lot of people are making money. So you have a lot of new chains that are spinning up um, that are trying to extend the scalability aspect of um, the Ethereum chain. So the new chains are tend to be like proof of stake. Yeah. Uh, and so what that allows you to do is trade things faster. So what a lot of people are doing is they're building bridges to Ethereum and trying to stimulate a market that allows you to trade faster um, that rep represents the same like assets. So one of the big sort of players in the space that are like doing that is like the near protocol. Uh, and they're doing that to try and like uh, speed things up in a more general way. And that is what, probably- What protocol like, was that? Sorry, I missed uh, that. Near. And so they have a bridge that they just built, but the bridge is not production ready by any means. It's like not gonna be ready for another six months. But the thing that's interesting about it is unlike other bridges, you can do all the validation on chain. And then unlike other bridges, it's cheaper to uh, sort of do the bridging. So uh, one of the things that really hamstrings the DeFi market on Ethereum is the price of gas. And because the gas price is so high, you could pay anywhere between 50 cents to $2.75 per transaction. So doing lots of transactions is like um, kind of hard. And then when the network is particularly congested, sometimes people are paying upwards of $30 to try and land their transaction fast enough. Um, so it makes uh, trading small or uh, low quantities uh, more expensive and it cuts into profits. So what people want to do is they want to move to these other chains and still have the same DeFi properties as Ethereum, and then move it back over uh, whenever they're done doing like their high frequency sort of trades. Um, so that a market is like still emerging. Uh, and there are a couple of different approaches to that on the technical side, but really people are just looking to trade faster. Um, one version of that that is in production already is uh, XDAI, you may have seen this. So XDAI is um, DAI 
on Ethereum, so MakerDAOs die, but um, represented on the POA network. And so the POA network is a proof of stake network that's kind of like a private ecosystem that allows you to move DAI around cheaper than if you were to do it on uh, Ethereum. So what people are doing is they're taking the DAI and then translating that into XDAI and then either swapping around a lot or doing whatever it is that they need to do. Um, okay, so that's like sort of the technology side where things are going. And a lot of people are interested in building bridge. Uh, ETC has a bridge um, that's coming out. Um, uh, a lot of chains have bridge, Thorchain, Rin. Um, if you look anywhere, you'll see these people trying to do these bridges, which is like a technological innovation to speed up, uh, to lower the cost of transactions, whether that's through time or like money. Um, the thing to think about the historical state of the blockchain is the actions that people were taking in the beginning of the chain uh, look radically different from the actions that people are doing today. So uh, prior to 2018, there really weren't liquidity pools. And then prior to that, uh, decentralized exchanges didn't really exist. So most of the transactions that happen were on centralized uh, exchanges. And so um, liquidity pools are just, um, ways for people to automatically market make. And so they rely on uh, various curves and formulas to try and uh, allow people to provide liquidity and make yield off of providing that liquidity. Um, and then at, instead of a fixed price, a price that uh, represents the points on the supply and demand curve. <laughs> so it's like if you have uh, X amount of DAI and so much ETH, or maybe DAI is a bad example. We'll say you have so much wrapped BTC and so much ETC. So we'll say for the sake of example, one wrapped BTC or one BTC is worth 10 ETH. Um, so someone will create a liquidity pool where they hold both sets of volumes at that particular ratio. And the idea is that this uh, stays constant. So that makes sense why it's K. Um, and so- it's like, a, it's like, like, a, it's like a, sort of like a near similar implementation of a bonding curve sort of structure. Yeah, it is exactly like that. And so, um, by keeping this ratio constant, it just moves the price up and down that curve depending on like what it is that you want to extract from it. So if you take out uh, more ETH, you have to put in some BTC. And if the supply of uh, ETH is low, then the price of like ETH goes up relative to BTC because you're playing with this ratio and you're on this curve. And so like most of the uh, like uh, trading that's happening today uh, in 2020 is working off of these automatic like market makers with different pricing oracles sometimes to try and augment people from doing this thing called front running uh, where you like drive up the price of the stock or the asset <laughs> make the sell and then like you cash in take, on, your like, take your profit right oh i see these transactions are coming in it's time for me to just drive the price and like then sell <laughs> yeah. you take your profit um which is something you can't do in a traditional market but it's the behavior that people are doing um and then the other thing that's getting even more crazy is this idea of flash loans uh, which i think i linked to before once, um, where people are able to take out a loan during the size of the block, which may be for a lot of money, that will only execute if uh, all of the like sort of quote unquote stars align. So what that means is like people have figured out a way to say, hey, look, 
here's a rate, I will give you a loan. I will do a transfer on the blockchain for, we'll say, 100,000 ETH. Uh, and you'll give me back like 5% of that ETH uh, on top uh, of the loan I gave you or whatever. And then uh, this trade will only execute if you're able to make all of the transactions pass. So you'll take like 100,000 ETH, you'll trade it on Kraken, uh, which will give you some assets, which you then trade on Uniswap, which you then give you some more assets, which you may trade on 0x. And then uh, you'll jump back into the smart contract at the end of that, and you'll pay the borrower some like 5% interest or whatever on top of like the 100,000 ETH you took out. Okay, so that's a lot. But the cool thing with the flash loan is within that moment, if the transaction fails, you didn't lose any money. So it's a way to basically lock in uh, a set of like profit <laughs> without enduring any of the risk outside of paying the gas price. So what people are doing is this behavior, which just started in 20, 2019, late 2019. <laughs> yeah, Mr. I find the, the, techno, the, I'd say the thinking behind or the, the technological implementation of them to be a very good case for, it could be a very good use case for certain regions if applied correctly though, outside of just the flash and sort of traditional space, but maybe in the mainstream sort of sense of unlocking certain financial pools of liquidity underrepresented markets, I think it would actually do a great deal of good. Yeah, it, it's interesting. So the space is just evolving really quickly. So that's kind of another sort of problematic issue with like uh, looking at the beginning of the chain and then looking at the chain today. Um, it's just because like, like the entire market dynamics are not quite the same, or at least I don't suspect that they are the same. There's a, there's a possibility that if you look at the data, you'll see like, oh, okay, it's mostly the same. And this is like a minority. Um, but looking at uh, the rise of stable coins from 2018 to 2020, uh, which are just uh, cryptocurrency backed by US dollars, uh, which now dominate all of the transactions on Ethereum. Uh, my, my suspicion is, is that uh, a model that like works in from 2015 to 2018 looks different from a model that works in 2018 to 2020. That like the dynamics of the marketplace just are like different because they're now entirely different asset classes on the market. That's my thought. Yeah, thanks for that. Yeah, I read I read a couple of interesting articles as well on those stable coins. I think there's one interesting one called Scylla as well. The one, I think I sent you a message on it that I think MIT is involved in there somehow. It's, it was quite an interesting project as well. Yep, yep, for sure. I think we we're looking at like uh, trying to get someone in from there. Thanks a lot. Stephen, uh, Brian, oh, Brian is that to uh, step out. Oh, I didn't have any question right now, but I will, I will certainly ask some questions if I have some, something. Okay. Um, Zane, thank you very much for your time. Yeah, no worries. Are you busy? <laughs> have a great one. <laughs> okay. Bye. <laughs> thank you. Later. Goodbye. Bye. Okay. Bye. So we are waiting for um... Ben, are you there? Yeah, I'm on. Okay. We are waiting for John to log in. I just got an email back from Scott like five minutes ago. Um, <laughs> okay. So that's good, I guess.
Uh, yeah, it, um, and then we'll have to do the the, the following hours around three thirty. I'm changing my view so I make sure I see when he comes in. He probably won't be outside today. No, I don't think so. No, he, he called me yesterday and he wanted to know what's going on. You know, um, so I think he's uh, he's looking to 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 get something done, and he was quite. He, he, um, okay, let me answer. To, to someone here. Um, yeah, no, he was very, he was very eager to, um, to find out more. And he says that if Scott doesn't get back to you, originally I thought you got in touch with him and he didn't call you back. And then you're saying you did not reach out to him. I wasn't too clear though. No, I just sent him and I sent him a message like a week ago. Um, oh, so you did reach out to him. Okay. So you did reach out to him and then he didn't, didn't pay attention or whatever. And then you reach out to him again. I just sent him one email and he just got back to me like 10 minutes ago. Okay, so we're going to okay. find a time next week to talk. Okay. I think John, John reached out to him and said, listen, we got to, um, this, you know, <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, it's okay. I mean, uh, in fact, maybe John will talk about that a little bit, but, um, let me see what he's doing. Um, because they should be ready to, um, Alex, are you there? Alex, sent you? Ao Cheng, can you hear me? Okay. Well, let's uh, let's switch to uh, following eyes. If uh, I don't I don't hear from John and I don't see him, maybe he's got some connection issue, whatever. So who's on for um, following eyes? Z one, are you there? Ao Chang, John Zhu, you you there? You said three thirty, so maybe they uh, maybe they walked away. Did I say three thirty? Well, I see some people here. <laughs> well, I'm being facetious. Uh, listen, uh, if there's no one there, and if John is not going to join, I don't, I don't want to waste everybody's time here. I mean, so for the people in ADC, uh, not. I mean, it's basically just Mike and. Uh, Z1, but or year on, sorry. Um, I just put together like some notes on uh, what John was referencing. Um, I put a document in the. So what? The what was this section four point four A? What was that about? Um, yeah, he was just referring to the section on like the um, funding for like equipment for the tenant. Um, so there's like a lot of options in terms of like what the fund would want to do and what the um move the company moving in might want to do so i just spent some time going through different like tax incentive programs um and like machinery slash equipment investment um programs whether it's like local small business loans um or like low interest loans um, through different programs either government run or like affiliated with certain economic development uh, groups like AEDC. Um, so there's just like some different options uh, there. Um, and then kind of put some notes down on like the pros and cons of like uh, a sale leaseback 
-hmm. So where the company would essentially sell their equipment to AEDC or to the fund um, or like some LLC or whatever and, and uh, lease it back to them. So there's like all different set of like strategies depending on what they're trying to accomplish. And it's not like something we need to decide. I just um, spent some time sort of looking at it. Okay. That's all about I had. That's about all I had. Um, we're gonna get a call with John or with Scott this week. Um, and okay, why don't we do that then? Uh, because I don't hear anything. Uh, anybody wants to talk about uh, falling knives? Okay, guys, see you next week. Uh, Professor Zora. Yes, Kevin. You could hang around. Uh, it's it, it's Jack. I was I was just oh, wondering. Jack, if, sorry. I was just wondering if we could just talk privately after this. Yeah, 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 sure. Okay, thanks. Got it. Uh, Professor, can I talk to you after uh, after Jack? Sure. Too? Let me uh, let me uh, join me on. Um, I'll send you an invite. Where to meet? You. Okay. Sounds Say where good. you are, Jack. Same thing with you. Okay. All right. Sounds good. Okay. Masella. Uh, I still I need to talk, uh, but I'll talk to you after all those guys. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, I'm late, gang. Uh, John, they just left. E. What's that? Yeah, they just left uh, because we thought uh, you had some technical issues or hold on. Let me see if I could bring uh, Ben. Hold on. What time is it? I thought it was supposed to be three o'clock. Three o'clock, yes. And we kind of just uh, you were the last, uh, the last. Hold on, hold on, hold on. They've been at it since uh, twelve o'clock. Oh, well. so it's so it's very long. Okay, I'll, I, let me get Ben. Uh, ben, can you join? Well, as long as they didn't need me for anything, I mean, I I just wanted to make sure we got up, you know updated what we talked about. Yeah, yesterday. no, I I want him to um, listen uh, to you for a second. No, no, it's good. It's good. Oh, he's coming back. Hold on, he's coming back. All right. Sorry about that. I, I no, just, that's okay. Uh, I was I was out at a meeting and I was coming back and I had a little bit of a problem with uh, traffic. And that, that's why I didn't respond. I mean, I'm seeing your text now, but I was like, you know, jumping in. So. <laughs> Sorry. That's okay. Ben, we're back. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I John is like here. Seconds. Uh, Hi, let me uh, get from back in there. Yeah, Maybe, uh, uh, Ben, you want to... Ben, that's a hell of a shot. Where'd you take that background picture? I don't know. I think it's the alumni building. I needed. I had oh, a. No, uh, I know. No, I know what week, it is. So I'm, needed... I'm trying to figure out where they shot it from, though. Oh, uh, I don't know. I needed a better like, background. It looks like it might be, because um, I think that's the front side. No, I think it's from the garage, alumni garage. There's a patio on the yeah. top of the garage. Yeah, I think so. Oh really? It looks like the front side, but okay, it could be the back side. You're right. No, the the alumni garage is actually on the side of the. Front oh no, side, I know where. So no, no, I know where it is because I park there all the time illegally. Oh, I might add, but uh, but yeah, I mean, I I'm just looking at the building and I'm going, gee, because yeah, you're right. There's that there's that glass tower in the one corner, so uh, yeah. it's a good shot of it. Um, I'll. I told Professor Zora this, but I got an email back from Scott like 10 minutes ago. Um, so we'll find a time to, to catch up uh, next week. Well, let me know if he's, not, he has, he's, he's got to be responsive. Yeah, I know. I, it took him a few days, but that's fine. Um, we'll, we'll find some time next week to sit down and kind of go through uh, questions and like requests for information, essentially. Because if you need me to, I don't mind talking with him about it. But he, you know, like I, I, I don't, I'm not sure that he's, well, I know he wants to respond. I just don't know what's going on. I know they're prep. We're having a strategic planning meeting. So what I was hoping uh, is to, and that's this coming Thursday. So it's like, yeah, but it would have been nice if we could have, you know, I could have incorporated some of this. I will, but I mean, a little bit more data, you know, into the strategic planning meeting. So, and, he, and we can't do that unless Scott's responding to you, which is what, what, which is why I said to Professor Zorro that 
you know, if I need to have a discussion with Scott, I don't mind doing that. So okay. besides all that, how's things going? Yeah. I mean, so things are good. Um, I spent some time looking at that item you mentioned, um, on the, like the equipment. Um, so like the sale leaseback aspect and then also like different programs that a company could use to invest, um, to get funds to invest in their, um, equipment if it wasn't through the, um, from a direct investment from the fund. Right. Uh, I mean, I can show you, I put up a little document. Well, well yeah, I just really wanted, I mean, just, so what I was saying uh, is a little more simple than that. I just would like to, so let me just hold this up. I just like to take that document and make sure that we have that item D under four on that. Oh, just so that I, okay. Yeah, just, I mean, just so that I can use it as a good outline, because what I'd really like to do, if you could update that and send it to me, what I'm going to do on this coming Thursday when we have our strategic planning meeting at AEDC, I'm going to be talking about this and saying, listen, they're moving forward here. You know, this is the kind of things they're doing. I need, and I need everybody to support their efforts. When they ask you a question, I need you to respond promptly, you know, because I'm trying to get them moving so that we can get it done. So as you guys are finishing up, you're part of it, they can be implementing. Okay, yeah, I'll send that over uh, today. Okay, that'd be great. And the one and the one item, and I was thinking about this after the meeting, I was not terribly clear. So on number four and on D, there's almost two subparts to that. Number one, I do believe based on the work done last semester, so I'm gonna to try to be more clear. Unfortunately, some of this stuff is just not that cut, you know, cut and dry. Yep. Based on the work done last semester, I believe that we can get investment out of the funds we would bring in. We would have to create some kind of a tranche to be able to invest that way. But the other thing I was talking about was banks and CRA. Remember I was talking about the community. I do believe, and, and when we get this just a little bit further, I'm going to go reach out to, because I know a number of bankers including my own bank, but I mean, I know a number of other bankers and I was going to have informal conversations with them and say, look, if we do this, because the, it gives you all CRA credits, if we are doing, you know, if AEDC is doing the land and we're doing the shell building and we're bringing in companies into these areas, are you willing to lend them money under your CRA investment criteria to do the equipment because then it'd be one less thing we would have to do. So I think that we kind of break 4D into two pieces. One is that we could use an investment tranche from our investment funds to fund it, or we may be able to talk to the banks. And that would also be my inducement to have the banks maybe even take out the fund after the 10 years to create a more permanent loan status as a repayment vehicle for either the the investment in the land or the investment in the shell building or uh, the investment in plant and equipment, you know, for the companies moving in. So I think there's kind of an interesting complexity as we get past the beginning of this thing, you know, to be able to leverage the fact that the QOZs happen to be in areas where banks can invest uh, and get credits for uh, Community Reinvestment Act credits, which are necessary for their abilities to stay as a bank. So at some point when you guys are ready, I will go talk with the banks. And if you want to talk with the banks, I can set up those meetings, but it's a matter of how much you all would like to do or not. But, and I don't mind, you know, but I'll get at least a preliminary feel to find out if they're at all interested. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. I spent some time looking at the different like uh, low, uh, low interest rate loan programs, like locally and state run. And there's a lot of different options through the, uh, development corporations. Um, one of the things I was curious was, is there any like relationship between ADC and the Lehigh Valley EDC? Yes. Like, is that Big, huge? We have, we have, we, have, we, they sit on our board. We sit on their board. Scott actually chairs one of their committees. Okay. Uh, one, and then um, you, we, we didn't talk about him, but he's very well aware of what you all are doing. He's, he's the fellow that, that runs a lot of our funds. And in fact, all the EDC, which is that local EDC, that's the regional EDC, it's the two counties EDC. Mm -hmm. So LV EDC actually turned over one of the loan programs 
for AEDC to administer because we have somebody that's very capable of administering the program. So we were actually administering a program for that LVEDC turned back over to us. So we're very close with those people. Why do you ask? Um, just because there was a lot of overlap in terms of like the programs, like some were run from LVEDC and some were run by ADC, um, just like looking at the different yeah. Um, programs. Yeah. Yeah, we try not to duplicate work. So we try not to do the same. So that's what we always pick. Who's going to do the program? Is it us or you? Mm -hmm. You know, so yeah. And, and we, our criteria are pretty much if in general it's for the whole Lehigh Valley, we have them do it. But in this one case, like, you know, because we had a big debate about taking this one program back, for example. Because uh, we originally ran it, but when, when the, they started doing the whole program for the two counties, you know, we said, well, listen, it makes more sense for them to do it. Well, as it turned out, it, made, it didn't make as much sense. And because we did so many of them, it was easier for us just to do the programs because we did it. It was like one of those 80 20 rules. We ended up doing 80% of those loans. So they basically said, why don't you just book all the loans? Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, just like in terms of that item 4D, like, uh, putting a putting money in from the from a tranche or from the fund to invest in the equipment, manufacturing facilities, whatever it may be, versus using these programs. Like, do you think the rate the rate of return that investors in the fund would need would be um, much higher than like something this company could get through the low cost loan programs? Like, is it? Do you think they're comparable? Like, would, or would these companies automatically choose to get a, a loan from AEDC because it'd be cheaper? You know that. By the way, that's a great question. Very, very, very thoughtful question. Um, now, I have to admit that it's not something that I thought of. So, so kudos <laughs> to you guys for coming up with it. Uh, so now having heard the question, my, my guess is that it's probably cheaper to do it through one of the programs that low cost programs that, it, that are available to us. Mm -hmm. But what we'll do is we'll bring David Dunn in, who's the gentleman from AEDC that I was talking about, and we'll get him to weigh in on that. Okay. Yeah, I mean, that's just something yeah. I was thinking about. It's not necessarily... See, and this is the funny part. So, like, everybody thinks I'm so damn smart and I know everything. And so, you know, I'm not stupid, but I don't know everything. And that's why I rely on the people, <laughs> you know, that... So David knows all those programs and he, he'd be a very great resource to ask that question of it. And we'll okay. ask him. Okay. Um, and we can either ask him through Scott or we can ask him directly because I know Scott does, Scott is, doesn't care. I mean, as long as, you know, as long as it's good, really going to be how David wants to, you know, funnel the information because it's probably good that Scott involved David so that Scott also knows the answer to that. But that's a very good point. The other, okay. the other comment I would make, um, and, and that's going to sound funny, if, number one, it's going to be like for the most part, that's correct. Because I don't know all the programs, sometimes the programs require some equity by the company. And so in the case where they require some equity by the company, that equity could come on the equity side of the equation, in which case we might figure out how to leverage those funds because it is a loan through whatever program we would do. Okay. Which is why you guys are master's candidates and I'm not. <laughs> I don't know if you're watching them, but look at, look at, look at Professor Sorrow, he's laughing. We're gonna change the name of the program. That's what we're gonna do. What are you gonna do? What, what are you gonna call it? You, you guys are master's candidates and I'm not, is that? <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, now that's something that we, uh, you know, at the IAC, John, uh, we'll, we'll need to, we'll, we'll discuss is, uh, you know, what, what, what the direction, uh, what kind of, what, what should the student be uh, learning going forward as opposed to, um, you know, uh, what's going on now? Uh, do we need other type of, you know, what we're doing now, for example, right? Um, I'm sure that Ben in his course, his curriculum right now is doing none of that, right? Yeah. Well, think about it. How many times do you get a chance to actually, you know, design or engineer the financial structure of a deal like this? I mean, there's so many moving parts to this thing, Correct. you know, and, 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 and exactly what, you know, what, what the team was doing and what Ben was talking about is exactly what you should be thinking about. It's like, okay, well, is, what's, 
what's the best thing to do? We can do it this way. We can do it this way, but what's optimum? You know, what, what's the best way to do it? You know, and how do we, you know, leverage these different factors and sometimes figuring out, well, okay, how do we bite this apple? You know, how do we structure this and take bites at the apple in order to figure out, well, let's answer this question first, because some things are derivative, right? I don't have derivatives, but it's, one thing is derived from your decisions on how we structure this and then all the things, you know, start falling into place. And all of a sudden, as you're, as you're pointing out, there's programs where we can get very inexpensive money, you know, to do, you know, manufacturing, uh, you know, uh, equipment investment and the state sponsors it just like training, for example, you know, we're going to be looking at training programs. This is not part of what you're doing, but part of what AEDC will be doing is looking at the training programs that are available not because we want to uh, sponsor the training programs, but because with, that's part of the sale, right? We've got all these training programs in Pennsylvania where we can get you trained workers and the company doesn't have to necessarily spend all the money to train the, you know, the workers. Yaron, any questions, Michael? Nothing for, Karen, you were raising your hand at some point. Oh, that was from before. I oh, never okay. put your it down. Your blue hand is, is taken up. Like sorry, that. sorry. <laughs> okay. You know, you guys scare me sometimes, and I'll tell you why. And, and Patrick and I have talked about this. So, you know, when I was going, when I, you know, when I was your age, which was back when Moby Dick was a guppy, which you know, like when when the dinosaurs roamed the earth. You know, we asked a lot of questions, and you you guys like it's like, you know, we get talking and. You don't ask any questions. I'm going, well, do they understand this already? Are they trying to be respectful? Is it, you know, like it was, is it your generation? You know, so, so my son's a little bit about some, some of your ages. He's, you know, he's 28 years old. And so we were talking about that. He goes, dad, not everybody was like you when they were like you, like your age. And it's like, well, yeah, but he goes, yeah, he says, you got to understand, like, you know, the way you, the way you are, people, are a little bit reluctant to ask questions. So I'm, I'm banking on, well, maybe he's right. So I'm gonna tell you, don't be reluctant to ask questions. I'm not, I'm not judging you. And by the way, I don't grade you. And I appreciate everything that you do and anything I can help you all with or learn or whatever, or, or educate myself. Like, you know, Ben just asked a great question. I don't know the answer. I'm not gonna BS you and tell you I know something that I don't know. So. I'm more than happy to do anything I can with any of you, ask any questions, and even off this call. So don't hesitate to call, you know, and, uh, and you know, don't be afraid to ask questions. I mean, I'm actually, like I said, it was like, okay, well, is it just like your style not to ask questions or are you guys like totally bored with this project or what? But I'm just, I'm not used to like, like nobody asking any questions. We'll have so, plenty, we'll have plenty to come. All right, that's a good deal. Okay, guys. Thank hey, you keep up the good work. Sorry, I was late today. I really, I apologize. Thanks no, next for wait a little longer. We'll, we'll, we'll drop, drop, drop. You know, no worries. Uh, we'll send over the uh, the outline, and then uh, I'll forward up. I'll follow up with you after we talk to Scott uh, next. So week. I have one quick question before he hangs up. How are y'all doing? Everybody, you know, feeling good, safe. Any anxiety? Uh, just like the usual amount of. Uh, this 2020 anxiety but that's about it karen actually uh karen was sick last week right two weeks ago but you're fine now yeah yeah i don't think i got the the covid though i think it's uh common flu or and you know i didn't have my ac on for 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 a night and I, it okay. got me sick yeah nothing serious uh, that's the that's the lehigh valley flu it, it's not really a flu it's the change of seasons here Exactly. Yeah, I was going to say, I already got tested like for three times. <laughs> like, I feel like every other week I have to come to Lehigh and got tested again. So, and health-wise, I think I'm pretty good. Well, they, well, released, good. they released the new numbers. I just saw them from Lehigh and the numbers are getting a little bit better, right? So they're seeing less, but, but now they they're concerned that everywhere else in Pennsylvania, if everything is going up now, even though it seems to be under control at, on campus. So I'll say. Well, you know, I'm, 
when I look at the numbers, I, I don't I don't think people are very good at nonlinear math between you and me. So when I look at the numbers, I had basically forecasted at the beginning of this thing that about now we would see the like kind of a little bit of a second wave. And that's what I really think we're seeing. I mean, I think you're seeing it internationally, but I think you're seeing it here. But people are so used to cause and effect and very linear type math that I don't think they, you know, they really grasp how this works. So I think people are, you know, it's like, oh my God, you know, there's, that's going to go back up. It's like, well, there is a second wave that you typically see in this kind of stuff. And it's, I think you're seeing it. So, but I'm glad that, you know, yeah, I've seen, I've seen Lehigh's numbers. I'm glad to see them where they are. And by the way, when you look at all the hospitals capacities in the, in this region, the hospital, hospital capacities are like highly available. Yeah, yeah, sure. yeah. There's there's not a lot of beds being occupied with COVID nineteen. So, which is always a good thing. If you, if you ever worry about anything, it's not that it's not that you get sick. It's really well. If I get sick, what happens? And if you don't have any beds, you know that's bad. But when you got plenty of beds, it's always a good thing. And the treatment protocols are like really great. And by the way, just so that you know this, if anybody's really at risk out of everybody on this call, I'm the guy that's really really at risk. <laughs> So we're not coming to your house anytime soon. Right, exactly. Like, you know, it's like everybody it's like you have, John, if, you have, a, if you have a 10% to to chance I've got an 80%. Over. Yeah, if, if you've got a 10% chance, I've got an 80% chance. It's like literally that bad. So I try to take good care of myself. But I'm glad to hear you all are are doing well. And uh, like I said, if you need me for anything, including just chatting, just give a call. We're here. Yeah. Yep. They all want to come to see your pool. That's what they want to do. Oh well, you know what? We'll throw up. Well, you know what? We'll throw a big party. That's what we should do. Whenever this thing is over, we say, "Wow, look at this place. We gotta go there. We gotta, we gotta hang around at John's house." We say, "Sure, well, not now. That's for sure." Yeah. I think we'd be expelled if we had a party right now. Oh yeah. Well, I got news for you. Not only would you be expelled, they would come find me. They probably yeah. would terminate like all the degrees they awarded me because I actually mm -hmm. earned them. <laughs> then because I know so many people at Lehigh, they'd kill me. And then I actually do, I, I don't think Patrick told you this, but their professors are told you this. I actually um, just got signed on. Uh, the, are you familiar with the Enterprise Systems Center? It's yeah. part of the industrial engineering. So I'm, I actually do a little bit of uh, advisory work for them. And, you know, so they probably would terminate my contract over there. So yeah, I'm, I've been trying to behave myself. So, okay. You guys you take guys care. Have a great Thank week. Thank you, everyone. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.